Okay, I guess uh, we are live now. Uh, Joel, let me know uh, if there is any issue on the uh, on the YouTube live site. Let's go to double check, I guess. Yeah, we'll check. Okay. So in the meantime, I guess it's probably we can get started. Uh, if there is any issue, we can, uh, we can try to fix it afterwards. Uh, all right then, uh, so welcome everyone to another uh, 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 Safari Live Seminar uh, talk. Uh, today uh, we'll be having uh, Hasindu. Uh, Hasindu is a lecturer in bioinformatics at the School of Computer Science and Engineering at UNSW uh, Sydney, uh, where he also completed his PhD in 2020. Uh, he's also a visiting scientist in the Genomic Technologies Group at the Garvan Institute of Medical Research, Australia, again. Uh, and previously, he worked as a genomics computing research scientist at the Garvan Institute, Garvan Institute of Medical Research from 2020 to 2022. Uh, Hasindu's research interests include the design, development, and optimization of bio bioinformatics software for real-time third generation sequencing data analysis and prototyping no uh, novel domain-specific computer systems for efficient uh, genomics data analysis. He has published in top journals in the field of genomics bioinformatics, including Nature Biotechnology, Genome Biology, and Oxford Bioinformatics. And I guess most of us uh, know him from uh, several uh, of his uh, famous works, including uh, 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 several works related to slow five and below five formats and, and Haru uh, for uh, hardware software core design of uh, uh, raw nanopore signal analysis, let's say. So with that, it's my pleasure to, uh, I guess, uh, uh, having uh, Hasindu here today. And uh, I guess with that, you can start Hasindu. Right. Uh, so thank you very much, Dan, for that uh, lively introduction. Uh, so I don't have to introduce myself. I can directly uh, go into the topic. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about an ecosystem for scalable and computationally efficient nanopore data processing. Uh, because the audience is uh, mostly computer science, as I believe, I would spend some time explaining you some general bioinformatics terms such as nanopore, genome sequencing, genomes, DNA, and those in the beginning. And then I will go into the topic and uh, give you some uh, idea into it. So from basic biology classes, we have learned that uh, any uh, like human being or any uh, living organism is made up of trillions of cells. And in these cells, there is this thing called the genome. We can think of it like a self-executable computer program. In a computer program, we have all the instructions and the data needed to start a program and run it through the lifetime. Likewise, the genome in the biological world is something that contains all the data and the instructions to make a living organism from the scratch. And not only that, then to keep it going until its death. Uh, so what is this genome? So in the cell, there is something called the nucleus, the center of the cell. And there, uh, we have this genome information encoded in these molecules called DNA, if it is uh, organisms like humans. And if it is RNA, if it is viruses, it would be like RNA. So there are these things called chromosomes, which are like chapters in a book we can think of. If the genome is a big book, chromosomes are like chapters. Yeah, so these chromosomes are made up of pairs of DNA, where this DNA is a very long molecule made up of small uh, series of nucleotides, which we call A, T, C, G bases. So the genome language is only composed of four letters, A, C, G, T. So all the information is encoded using these four letters. And a human genome, for example, 
is around 3 billion base pairs low. And if you take something like the coronavirus, of course, it's small, around 30,000 bases. And interestingly, if you take something like wheat, it is like 20 gigabases, like six times the human genome. So it doesn't mean that a long genome means the organism is more intelligent or uh, complex. So these are mysteries. And now let us go into this thing called DNA sequencing. So as obviously, because this DNA is the blueprint of life, reading it and then using it for different purposes will have a lot of benefits, like for medical applications and to understand what's going to happen to you in the future and also in agriculture, forensics, any area where the biological organisms are involved, this studying about the DNA is very important. So the process of reading this DNA molecule onto the computer is called DNA sequencing. So we have this blood or tissue or whatever, and you extract the DNA molecules out of the uh, cell, which is something I'm going to discuss later. But as you may know, this DNA sequence is a very fragile thing. So while doing that extraction, it will break into pieces. And in some technologies, like second generation sequencing, which I'm going to talk about in the next few slides, we used to intentionally break it as well to increase the throughput when reading. So anyway, at the end of the day, the DNA sequencer get a large number of these pieces. And these things are like one by one sequenced and you onto the computer get the ACGT representation. And we call these reads. And once we have these reads, we need to do computational analysis to get any meaningful information out of it. Because these are pieces. It's like solving a jigsaw puzzle. Like you have to like put every piece to the correct place. In case of known organisms like humans, scientists over like decades have made something called a reference genome. That is like a representative example for the species. So we can use this reference genome to map these reads to the correct place by using different algorithms, which we call alignment or mapping. And then once we do it, we can look at the differences in the like aligned sample compared to the reference. These things we call variants. So these variants are the uh, factors that changes one human being to another. And also these are indicative of different diseases you might get, or if you are going to be like, uh, going to risk, have the risk of getting some disease and so on. But it is a bit challenging because genome sequences are not perfect. They make a lot, bit of errors when reading it. So we need to identify these like variants out of these uh, noisy, uh, reads. So it's a challenging task and we call it variant coding. For example, here obviously only one is different to the other, so it would be a uh, like a mistake rather than actual variant. But in real world, it's not going to be simple as this little example I gave you. That's why we have the whole domain of genome analysis. And this variant calling pipeline is just one example of genome analysis. There can be like many, many hundreds of other workflows as well. For example, if it is a like unknown species, we have to, we don't have a reference. We have to take those pieces of reads and then generate the reference out of the scratch, which we call Dnoverse NP. Anyway, going deeper into DNA uh, uh, like analysis and also uh, like sequencing, Oh, I just realized I have a typo. This should be DNA sequencing analysis, obviously. So now looking into the DNA sequencing, now the sequencer is simply, we can think of as a large sensor array that can in parallel uh, read like DNA strands. Uh, so when we get a blood or tissue sample, the uh, like those who are in the lab do what we call sample preparation, getting the DNA out of the cell and then 
adding adapters and checking QC. And if it was second generation, like intentionally fragment the uh, reads so that it can be read in parallel through millions of sensors. So this is the DNA sequencing part. So I'm going to keep that part abstract because what we are interested in is in the sequence analysis. So you can get reads either in forms of HVG is or in modern sequences, they even output the raw measurement so that you can convert the measurement into basis yourself, uh, which we call base coding. And sequencing analysis, as I have shown here, it's very compute intensive. And uh, there are like hundreds of different workflows targeted for different types of analysis. And when you take one sequence analysis workflow, it's made up of like dozens of softwares, one after the other, which are run. And if you zoom into one of the softwares that are containing like again, hundreds or dozens of algorithms, which are connected to each other using a number of parameters. So these are pretty complex um, and has been developed by the bioinformaticians over the years. Now, just about the history of DNA sequencing technologies, the first generation, which were like, like 30, 40 years ago, this is an example of a Sanger sequencer, which is very big, not much used today, uh, because it used to be expensive and the throughput was low. And then probably the most used one today at the moment is the second generation sequencers. This is an example Illumina sequencer, uh, not cheap, it can be a few million dollars. Um, to buy. And one thing with Illumina sequences is they, when we are doing the sequencing, we have to intentionally break the reads into pieces, like 100 to 200 bases around that. And then we get the short pieces. This is the most like established uh, method as today, which is being used by a lot of applications. But there is this emerging generation called the third generation, uh, which is very interesting because it has many more advantages than what the second generation sequencing had. There are two major companies uh, producing third generation sequences, one called Pacific Biosciences, the other one called Oxford Nanopore Technologies. So today my talk will be mostly revolving around these nanopore sequences. The reason is I find it pretty interesting because it's the first portable DNA sequence out there. As you can see, this Minion sequences I even have here on my hand, it's very small, like it's very portable. Whereas other sequences are like 500 kilograms uh, like weight, definitely not portable uh, unless you are an elephant. Uh, so, Anyway, let's now go into nanopore sequencing. So these are three example nanopore sequences produced by the Oxford Nanopore Technologies Company. This is the portable minion, which I just showed you on my hand here. And then they have this benchtop version called the gridiron, which is like five times powerful as this minion. And then we have this like large desktop version called the Promethean, as the name, name suggests. It's a beast. It's capable of sequencing like 48 human genomes in parallel. And within like three days, this will generate like 50 terabytes of compressed data. So now let me go deeper down into how nanopore sequencing works. So in this DNA sequence, there are this like consumable called flow cell, which you can remove. So this is a consumable. Once you load the sample and do the sequencing, it's finished you have to get a new one. So one of them is like several hundred dollars. So inside the flow cell, like into the flow cell, you using a paper, put the processed GNA sample, whatever the lab, like tasks I mentioned before, and then uh, we connect it into the sequencer like this, and then we plug this into the computer through USB-C, and you launch the software called Minino, which is the sequence acquisition software, then you get the data. And usually within like 72 hours, this consumable fully extinguishes all the pores inside and the experiment finishes. 
So if you look at the flow cell, let me take my laser pointer, you can see this is the, this is the sensor. And inside they have a, like a, a SIC, uh, which we don't have much information about. It's a proprietary thing. And it is connected to a sensor chip where they have like this pico ampere range uh, meters uh, and some digitizers. And then these tiny little holes are called nanopores. So these are only like one to two like nanometers like uh, wide and only one DNA strand go through it. And when the DNA strand go through it, they measure the current variation across the pore. Depending on the size and the shape or whatever of the like molecule A or C or G or T, it will change the ionic current. And based on this, we can uh, decode what actually passed through the pore. That's the basic principle behind nanopore sequence. As you may imagine, it's not going to be a very beautiful signal. It's going to be very noisy because it's pico ampere arranged. And to make things worse, these nanopores are not able to just contain one single nucleotide. At a time, there will be a few nucleotides in it, which we call the came. So in say, like, it's like around six to 10 uh, as per ONT. So, so there are many possible variations and you get the current. And finally, by looking at these uh, like current signal variations, we can decode it into the EFGT basis. And that process is called base coding. So today my talk is going to be about this signal data. So this signal, which is a pico ampere range signal, it's converted, of course, internally, they have an analog to digital converter that gives us a digitized signal, which is 16 bit, each sub and this. So as I told you, one Promethean sample, for example, one human genome would be like one to two terabyte when compressed. And we tend to keep this data for the future, the reason is the base corners, the software that converts the raw signal into ACGT bases, they keep on improving. So, because sequencing is expensive, each Promethean flow cell is like $1,000. So you can't just throw the data and sequence every time we want. So we keep the data so that in the future, when a base corner improvement comes, you run it and get better results. And also there are these modified bases. Right? There are other dimensions of data. For example, C has different types of Cs, like methylated C and non-methylated Cs. It's found that like in humans at least, when Cs are methylated, it can affect how the genes are turned on and off. So it's like on and off switch for genes. So these kind of things are also possible to be identified by looking at road signal. So because of this, we tend to keep the data and when new methods come, we base code. So as you may realize, it's a large data set and the Oxford Nanopore Technologies used a file format called fast file to store this data. So this had some problems and we solved the problem by using a format we developed called slow file. So now I will go into that uh, area. So from like 2017 to 19, problems with fast five format was apparent. It's based on this format called hierarchical data format, which is originally de uh, developed in 1990s for storing uh, like heterogeneous data. Somehow Nanopo decided to use this format to store Nanopo signal data, which is not really heterogeneous, but more homogeneous due to some unknown reasons. One annoying technical problem we had was HDF5 is not multi-threaded. There is a thread safe version true, but internally they protect their global data structures by applying a lock. So consequently, even if you use multiple threads, it's only one thread doing the access at a time. So this was a pretty like bad thing for performance. 
when we wanted to do methylation calling, for example, using signal data, it used to take like 14 days on a high performance computer because this was taking the most of the time. And apart from technical problems, there were practical problems too. This Oxford Nanopore technology is being a company that rapidly evolves. The fast five schema they had was not very stable. They used to do ad hoc changes in every update. So as being developers of bioinformatics tools who use signal data, this was not very good because instead of focusing on the research problem, we had to keep putting our effort into fixing our tools to keep using the new formats. So it was a lot of time consuming and a bad experience. And also in Garvin Institute, when we were doing like a lot of sequencing as a sequencing service, every few months after update, we had to change all our pipeline. So most of the time had to be spent on that kind of maintenance than on research problems. So in 2019, we uh, like openly told the problems like this with Fast5 on Twitter. Uh, and as you can see, Fast5 reading takes like 62 hours where the whole processing was taking only three hours. As you can see, it's a ridiculous IO bottleneck, which is pretty bad for scaling up nanopore, especially going for population level things. And uh, like we were consistently telling ONT to do something about it, uh, but uh, like we didn't see it going anywhere. So then in a few months, we just even like made a prototype format called slow five, uh, uh, and showed that we can even do this like 10 times faster. So six hours IO opposed to 60 hours for fast five. Of course, this was initially like a job to push Nanopo uh, to uh, do something real. Slow five initial format was just a text-based tab delimited format. So the point was even such a small, like a simple format can easily outperform that complex fast point. Um, and then we thought probably ONT would like come up with a good solution. Um, anyway, I even submitted this data like as one of my thesis chapters. And then like one of the thesis reviewers was Hingley, like who, the developer of Minimap samples and all other like, great software in bioinformatics. He just asked one question, how about a binary format? So that's one reason that encouraged us to really pursue this idea into a real format. And at that time, now it has been like a year or two, ONT didn't do a solution. So fast find was an impeding factor at Garvin Institute. We couldn't scale up our sequencing service. So my team lead at that time told, okay, let's seriously develop this into something real so that at least we can solve our own problems. Of course, then we started like actual slow five, slow five development, taking that prototype into a real usable uh, bioinformatics tool. Uh, and then after discussing with our lab mates and experts, we came up with a, like a good solution, a good like a format specification for both slow five, which is the ASCII based format and blow five, which is the binary based format. And then in like an year, we uh, pr like published this uh, as a preprint uh, in BioArchivex, along with the long specification, two libraries, the C library and the Python library and the toolkit for losing this uh, format. Uh, still ONT didn't uh, had done anything. And we showed that, okay, look, the performance is this much, and the file size, that was a side effect. This was some, not something we intended. But due to reduction of metadata, when we converted our whole archive at Garvin, we saved like, I don't know, like 2.5 times or something, like 400 terabyte to 150 terabytes. Lossy conversion, only because Fast5 is wasting data space as unallocated space and a lot of metadata redundancies because it was not for homogeneous data. And also importantly, ease of use. Looking at the software like SIGMAP, like fast five reading code is like 2,600 lines. 
whereas slow file is 79. So this shows that for a bioinformatics community, you can save a lot of your overhead in understanding and using the file format and instead use that time to do actual research. So we showed all this and finally pub got published in one of the like, best journals out there, Nature Biotechnology. And, and then suddenly after like um, one month, Oxford Nano woke up and then said, oh, we are developing our own file format called Pod5. And now Pod5 has become the default format. Uh, while of course it's better than fast format, the fast file format in terms of research community, slow file has many more other advantages and benefits. So that's why we keep on developing them for other researchers as well as ourselves in the sequencing facility of Garvin Institute. And of course, there is a converter from pod5 to blow5 and blow5 to pod5 so that you can use latest ONT data, which we call blue, blue crap, uh, which is available here. And now let me go into the slow5 ecosystem. Now it's not just a file format. On top of it, we have built a lot of other tools and methods, including the help, including with the help from other researchers. So I'm going to talk a bit about those things and show you how to use slow file in your uh, tools to make your life easier. Uh, give me a second so that I can turn off my light because it's getting darker here. Uh, yeah. Okay, now it's better. Okay, now let me try to get rid of this laser pointer so I can click the link. So, slow file ecosystem contains the specification, a lot of libraries, bioinformatics tools, workflows, a lot of example data sets, as well as learning resources. So, the main link is here. Okay, so all the stuff I am telling, you don't have to like remember. This is the only link you have to remember. Everything is linked from there. That's why I showed. Now let's go one by one into each of these. So any serious file format, I, in my opinion, should have a good specification because you have to think ahead, build it, and then follow it, not randomly doing changes every fortnight. So that's why the slow file specification is quite long. Uh, so you can like get a lot of information about the uh, format as well as nanopore seek like raw signal data by going through the specification because Oxford Nanopore Technologies doesn't put too much effort into documenting stuff. Uh, so we took uh, this as opportunity to document all we know about signal data. So it's a very long document tells what every like little parameter or like attribute is in signal data which would be helpful even if you are using fast five or pod five or whatever. It's a very long document. You can control F and find what you want, but at least read the first few like bits before starting using slow file. And then going into software library, the heart of the slow file is of course a very high performance C library, which is 399 compatible. So that it's compatible with almost every you know, system out there. That's why we have used a very low level, like lower version of C. If you use like C++ 23, then you will have to only use that particular compiler version. Bioinformaticians and other biologists, they don't like always have the latest version. So that's why C99 compatible. And of course you can use C++ uh, with it. Uh, and then uh, in at least genomics world, uh, it's very common that people tend to use Python. Uh, so we have provided Python bindings for them to be used, even though Python is not the most efficient uh, uh, method to access large scale data like nanopore data. Uh, anyway, and then also read because biologists are like sometimes using R. So there's R library as well. This was mostly written thanks to this chat GPT. Yeah. So, and then there are other community developed tools, uh, sorry, libraries, for example, someone in the bioinformatic community developed a Rust uh, wrapper to slow file. 
and a go wrapper. So these are others who contributed to the slow five ecosystem. And at the end, I will go through the slow five silly library so that you can get a quick uh, grasp of how you can quickly use the library in your own tools. And now going into bioinformatics tools, there are a lot of tools now supporting slow five format. Of course, the main one is slow five tools, which is the toolkit for doing the fast five to slow five conversion and many other operations like merging files, splitting files, viewing the files into human readable uh, format and also getting read IDs, cutting. It's very bash friendly. You can use bash one liners to do a lot of analysis, which the bioinformaticians really love. So you can uh, like quickly compile and install slow five tools. It's written in uh, like C11 on top of the slow five library. And then for base calling, we have this uh, thing called buttery yield. Again, base calling is the process of converting uh, the raw signal data into fast Q reads. So guppy is the ONT's uh, production base caller, the small fish. So buttery eel we develop is a wrapper that nicely wraps around the guppy and do the job for us. So it takes slow five as input and then output uh, the fast queues. Results are of course identical to what guppy provides. And interestingly, it, base calling on HPC was like five to six times faster when using slow five than fast five. So we have these findings published in bioinformatics along with buttery. And Buttery latest version is supporting Dorado Base Call Server 2, which is ONT's newest uh, base call. And also we have a, like, because Dorado is, which is the new base caller from ONT, which is open source. So we have directly provided slow five support as well. Uh, and it's here. Uh, and if anyone wants to know what a Dorado fish is, it looks like this. Uh, while going through the code, I realize it's a bit similar to the fish uh, anyway. And then uh, we have uh, uh, like from some time ago developed this call, the tool called F5C, which is for signal level alignment and methylation calling of uh, data. So there was this software called Nanopolis, which is like a, like a part of like all the nanopore signal analysis. So we accelerated that using GPUs and we called it F5C. So this uh, supports slow five format directly and try tracking from the slow five talk. Like if you are interested in doing signal alignment stuff and want to learn about it, uh, a good place to start on technical content would be the supplementary section of the publication. So in all of my publications, usually it's the supplementary section that has the most like technical and useful information. Here is 25 pages and it will very in detail explain you the algorithm behind Nanopolis. And if you are like a video person, uh, you can look at the like the talk I gave at NVIDIA GTC. It's a long 50 minute video explaining how we accelerated the algorithm using GPUs because it's already there today. I'm not going to focus on it. And then we recently developed this thing called Squigulator, which is a simulator for generating nanopore data in some like, so, like bioinformatics development work, it's useful to have a simulator because you exactly know where the reads are coming from and you can control parameters and get cleaner data than real data, which would be useful in when you are like developing signal level tools at the beginning. So it's like directly based on slow file format and you can base call the reads and get even the reads. And of course, it's like much better than the exact existing simulators out there. For example, the deep simulator, it's much more faster and accuracy to real data, it's very close than deep simulator. So you can give a try. Yeah, and also my PhD student, Hiruna is these days developing a tool called Swigulizer with the high performance possibility of slow five, we are making it possible to do visualization of raw signal data uh, in uh, like near real time uh, scenarios. And then you may already have 
red disc, the Haru, the hardware accelerated uh, like uh, thing that was also like built on top of uh, slow five as a proof of concept because it was run on embedded system FPGA. And you may like realize that some bulky format like fast five, of course, you can't like get to easily run on like this distribution. So that's why we relied on slow five for this. So it's open source and it's available out there. And there are many other tools, which I'm not going to go into details, but you can always uh, go and like click on the bioinformatics tools and then like uh, find the list of supported software and uh, uh, thankful that can implemented slow file support to the slow file in Harrow hash as well. That helped to get it working because I had a hard time compiling because of some pod five issue because it's not compatible with the compiler version I have. So as you can see, that is one example where slow five would help other researchers. Um, like you don't have to wear like invest your time in keeping maintaining your thing to work. Whatever the like, changes ONT do to pod five or whatever, it will be like opaquely converted during the conversion will be opaquely handled and we will retain the backward compatibility. So many people ask like if slow five would be maintained in the long term, I said yes, because a good product doesn't need good like that much maintenance. Like it's written in C, it doesn't like break every day. Like only when ONT changes some field, we have to change the converter, that's all. So, so far things are running smoothly at Garvin Institute. We are like consistently using it for production purposes. And importantly, now we can spend more time on research than updating every single script in our workflow. Just change the conversion workflow, all smoothly handled. Anyway. Then those are the tools and then there are like bioinformatics workflows which uh, and data sets you can have a look if you want to see what they are like and yeah now i would go into the like important stuff learning resources because all of you might be interested in learning how to use slow five so again i would like to tell you go to the supplementary materials in the slow five paper it has the spec and all the detailed information and if you go into the slow five library, there are a number of examples that I have provided, which you can directly copy paste into your uh, software. For example, if you want to go through the reads one after the other uh, sequentially, then it's pretty like simple. Uh, you can like, go into the sequential read and then you can see it's just open the file. You go through using the get next and do whatever you want to the signal. All the necessary attributes are available in this uh, uh, like slow five record struct, which is available the format of the struct. You can go through the software library documentation here. And under the C API, you can see like it's well documented all the necessary things are there. If you look at the like flow file specification, details of what these mysterious parameters and things are there, you can find it there. And yeah, and this is a like a sequential reading example where both the reading and passing or decompression is done using one thread. When you are going into high performance applications where you need to multi-thread, uh, an example is provided under advanced examples. So if you look at the sequential read pre-thread, that would be the best uh, performance scenario. So here what we do is we sequentially get the bytes per each record using a single thread. And to do the decoding, you spawn multiple threads. So you can start a set of bunch of threads and then uh, like use this decode in parallel to make it even more fast. So for example, in GoHash, when you get a batch of reads, you can use get next to get the batch into the memory from the disk without doing any decompression. Then internally, when you are doing the processing, you definitely might have a bunch of threads, right? So the first step in that 
the threading workflow can be calling the decode function. So that way you can really, really go fast. This is the technique we use, we use in all of our techniques. Then it's like decoding compression done in parallel, very fast. And not only sequential access, slow five also supports random access for certain cases where you want to extract one or two reads, you can specify the read ID and uh, like directly get uh, the corresponding read. So that is explained in the random thing here. You load the index and then you simply do get as much as times you want by providing the read ID. The good thing with this get function is you can call this in parallel using multiple threads. It's thread safe and internally it uses the period 64 system call uh, that will enable us to in parallel fetch things from the like disk. Very like useful when you are like using raid arrays. That way we can quickly get random reads in parallel. And there are many other like advanced examples uh, which you can have a look. Uh, but that was like a many like a very brief mini tutorial I wanted to give so that you can get started with uh, using slow five, especially when you are developing new tools, so that you can save time. And also in an example template repositories here, uh, which I have provided with a make file and uh, some other like stuff explaining how you can use slow five in your project as a sub module with some like examples and explanations here. So you can have a look to understand the best practices I recommend when integrating slow five into your C project. I'm not going to talk much about Python today because the community here I'm talking would be very familiar with C and I like C. So yeah, Python is not my like favorite domain because every time I use Python, the snakes get entangled and I had to spend so much time uh, removing the knots. I just stick to see. Yeah. Anyway, like for example, Henley had quite a few times endorsed how why he thinks slow five would be the way to go future. And like, of course, we will keep maintaining slow five and prioritize the community needs, compatibility, transparency, for many years to come. And then there are some upcoming tools as well. Slow5 curl, which is built of, of the curl library so that you can access partial content from Blow5 files hosted in the internet. Rather than downloading a whole terabyte of data, if you are interested in a single gene, you can get the data relevant to that gene using this method. And also we are developing some new compression algorithm uh, which gives like a bit more compression ratio than the current uh, existing methods. So this low five is said lib and is said TD uh, are the current existing methods. So this is said TD compression method is comparable to what ONT is using in fast five and pod five, which they call VBZ. VBZ at the end of the day is a combination of stream variable byte algorithm plus is said standard. And also we are working on like using slow five to directly write uh, in mini you know, using some uh, techniques. Uh, so that because slow five writing is pretty fast. Uh, we could reach the rate of 48 Promethean flow cells on a Dell XPS laptop. So it's that fast when you write. So you don't need all these complicated formats when a simple method can do the job. So that's my opinion. And to make things complete, let me go into pod five as well. Uh, and first I would acknowledge just ONT finally did something and it's better than fast five. Uh, and uh, like the size wise and the performance wise, it would be uh, like close to slow five. Uh, but here I am going to tell different places where the slow five uh, method or uh, it doesn't need to be slow five. It can be any other domain specific binary format can shine than a general file format like pod five. So one advantage of a binary custom binary format like slow five would be the stability and the ease of use. 
And when we have well thought out, you don't need to change every few fortnights because all the ways things are changed, are they are in the specification. So if you spell all the specification, it's done automatically, backward compatibility. And no dependencies, only Zlib is the de major dependency, which is anyway they are in almost every systems. Whereas pod five, um, it has boost, uh, row and few other libraries. So compiling it on the scratch would be uh, extremely hard thing. That let, leaves us to using ONT binaries, but then binaries have their own incompatibility problems and it's not available on other custom like architectures like RISC-V. And well-documented is another advantage of practical advantage of slow file compared to pod file. And let me go into some technical advantages in slow five, which I would think are applicable. So one thing with, uh, I mean, one major difference between slow five and pod five is this. Slow five is a row-based storage, whereas pod five is a column-based storage. I'll go into details with the figure in the next slide. And the other major difference is slow five is mostly based on traditional buffered ID. Whereas pod five relies, relies on this thing called memory mapping, which you may know. Why I think buffered IO is better, I'll explain the next slide. And then again, slow five is a domain specific format, which is future proof, especially for us when we are building a domain specific architectural systems. So about uh, pod five, so it is based on this general file format called Apache Arrow Inter-Process Communication Format. So if you go into details, it's a column-oriented format. So let's say we have an example like this, where each record uh, has three attributes. So in case of nanopore data, we can think this is the read ID, this is the row signal, and this is the scaling data and other metadata associated with each read. So in slow five, we in memory store in the row based store like this. First you store the read ID and then this one, this one, and after storing the first record only, we would go to the second record. Whereas in arrow, they store the first column in the memory continuously first, and then the second one and so on. So this, Column oriented stores have become very famous recently when you are doing like, uh, like data analysis. The reason is, let's say we take something like Facebook profiles, for each person, there will be like billions of different parameters, right? Or like metadata. When someone want to see a relationship between advertisement and a person, you don't need to know all the columns. So the good thing with column oriented story there is you can just extract all the columns of all the people very quickly. But if you look at nanopore data, signal data is the major thing. And then the associated metadata like the read ID and the scaling factors are quite associated with the read signal. So for any analysis, if you are going to access the row signal, there are like 99.9% .9 chance that you would need the other metadata. So if we store like this, what happened? For single read, you had to do like many random accesses, which is unnecessary. But in slow five, it's very contiguous. So one like sequential access would cover the whole record. So this way we can have a very cache friendly, you know, like about like temporal and uh, spatial locality. So I don't need to go into details. So looking at the access pattern of most nanopore analysis, having a, like a contiguous like metadata and the signal in one place would be intuitively better than spreading it across the like disk. So that's my opinion. And then this pod five format is based, like it's for inter-process communication. That's the name suggests it's a format designed for storing like temporary data while you want to like 
exchange data from one process to another or one language to another. So even like in the row frequently accessed uh, question page, they recommend the other format called Parquet for long storm storage rather than using IPC for that. So it's very unclear why ONT selected this temporary IPC format rather than using Parquet. That's another like an open question I have in my like mind. Like so, it's very hard to say what would happen to a file you store today because Arrow themselves wouldn't be committed to keep the backward compatibility if that is not their primary goal. And then about memory mapping, this is a very like old article from Linus Torvalds. Uh, you know who th that is, developer of Linux. So. He has like long time ago warned where memory mapping is good at and where it is not good at. So the idea is in nanopore sequence analysis, we know the exact pattern that's going to be. So what's the point of like trying to use memory mapping? We could like the programmer would know more than the operating system, how best we could read the data to avoid unnecessary misses in the caches. Because of that, like it's better we use traditional IO for workloads like this, rather than trying to piggyback the access into the operating system. So this is another like, uh, like burning, like, you know, like uh, issue I think that would slowly become apparent with pod five in the future. Then many, uh, like, because it's obviously going to blow up the virtual memory and affect other processes. Of course, when you measure the single file IO performance, it might look okay, but when you try to work with other processes, it might start affecting the performance in negative ways. And then, you know, like you may have seen this graph, the famous graph, which I'm a bit tired showing uh, many, many times. Uh, so sequencing technologies are like going faster than Moore's law, they claim. And we know that Moore's law is kind of now like saturated as pointed out by Patterson and Hensley. So the future of computing as we know is going towards domain specific architectures like processors. First of all, I believe we should have a format that is domain specific having like a general format, which is so complex and like not well suited for a particular purpose is going to be like a step going backwards when you come to uh, like domain specific hardware. So these are the reasons why I think uh, Slofi would still have many uh, more performance and other advantages compared to Slofi, pod five. And then acknowledgement, there were many people involved and everyone in the community who helped. Um, yeah, and now uh, away from slow five, I would show some other like example works I have done apart from that in a few minutes. Uh, one method is like this method we developed to Im like make it possible to run minimap to uh, on systems with lower amount of RAM. For example, if you take a mobile phone or something, or even a Jetson nano board, we have only like four GB of RAM. But this Minimap 2 software, which is like the state of the art long read aligner, takes like 12 GB of RAM to uh, map the human genome. So here we came up with a partition method of the index uh, so that we can reduce the RAM usage dramatically depending on the number of partitions. Uh, and importantly, without affecting the accuracy, because if you just split chromosomes and do it, uh, your accuracy will be drastically affected and we can't afford that. So there is an algorithm that like do the merging intelligently in this method that makes the accuracy same as using minimum with one partition. So in, importantly, this method was like uh, adapted to minimap to uh, soon as we like sent a pull request showing that it's something which is very like uh, promising. 
and then like publication is here and some example videos and stuff are here if you are interested in this algorithmic method and also based on this because when you just say this like people are not like taking it seriously so we made it something called Ginopo, which is an Android smartphone. Of course, the concepts are similar, but when you say it runs on a smartphone, it's like giving much more like, you know, um, outreach to general people. Okay, so that's why we built this proof of concept application, not just allowing Minimap, but many other tools to run on a mobile phone. And as expected, there was a quite a bit media coverage for this uh, publication. And another work from one of my PhD students trying to accelerate FPGA, uh, so Minimap 2 chaining component using FPGA. And there was like, I think, 20 to 30% improvement in performance. And then for fun, we have made some like uh, uh, clusters like this using different uh, like jets and boards and stuff to do genomic processing which we call high performance embedded system. Um, like it's quite good to like show to people because there are a lot of like glowing lights and people who come to visit like them. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, like all I have today. Uh, I'm surprised that I have finished it right on time. Uh, yeah, so let's go into questions. And Great, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Asun. It was uh, it was a great talk and it was uh, very interesting. Uh, um, so, I mean, I have uh, lots of questions, uh, but maybe uh, uh, I can also quickly check. So, I see some questions also on, on YouTube, at least one, so we can try to cover those. But I'll start with perhaps uh, one of the relatively the more obvious ones. So what is the Achilles seal for uh, slope five? So what are the current problems with slope five? So I was going to actually ask about this trade-offs between pot five and slope five, and you already actually covered it. Uh, um, but I would also be uh, curious about uh, the, the potential issues that you're seeing right now related to slope five, but also uh, regarding this uh, conversion, from pot five to slot five, right? There is this toolkit that can do that. Um, yeah. So I guess when we think about this real-time analysis, uh, the throughput is extremely important, I guess, right? The throughput yeah. would be everything. The, 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 the tool that's making the analysis, whatever the S plus any conversion, et cetera. So what yeah. is the overhead of that conversion, especially for this real-time analysis purposes? So can you elaborate on these a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So. I mean, that depends on like how, like the granularity of real time. So if you are doing something like selective sequencing, there is like no point in writing to the disk at all on the first place, right? You should be doing the analysis while in memory. But if you are going to things like base calling, live base calling and uh, live, mapping and stuff, then converting, sorry, the writing to the disk made sense. So conversion wise, it was a bit of a problem with fast five because you can't use multiple threads. It was taking most of the time. But the good thing was at that time, even if you convert, still the benefits you got from the other steps were quite substantial. Like you spend like few hours converting, but then you save like 48 hours to like six hours. So the sum of the two was still better for that kind of things like real time, uh, live base calling and live uh, mapping and stuff. In terms of pod five, because it supports multiple threads, now that is quite uh, faster. So we don't see like, uh, like an overhead, uh, at all when doing this. For example, at Garvin, we are like doing live uh, fast five to slow five or pod five to slow five conversion while the sequencer is doing it. So when a batch arrives, like 4,000 reads, within like one second, you have a slow five file and then that's done. So it's quite keeping up with the data rate 
at even 48 flow cells. Yeah. So I would say it's like a negligible impact comparing the benefits you would have in the like upcoming uh, like steps. Yeah. That makes sense, I guess. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I'll let perhaps others to ask questions before I ask yeah. the other, other questions of mine. So, hi, Hasina, great talk. Thanks a lot. Um, so you mentioned uh, already that going to um, file or going to uh, storage isn't necessarily the way in real-time analysis. Um, and then I'm wondering, is even thinking of it as a file the right way to deal with this data? Shouldn't it be more like a data stream, you know, like, like in a TCP connection? Uh, so if you are going into real-time works, I think that could be the way to go. But the main reason we need to put it to a file is the future because base callers keeps on improving and you will need to keep redoing the analysis, right? So for that purposes, we need to always like write to a file. And the other thing is that at the moment, the onboard sequencing computer cannot keep up with the data yet especially live base calling. So there's no other way to do everything in like, you know, time. So, because you may know like at the beginning of the flow cell, you get a huge throughput. You can't keep up with that when base calling, but slowly the throughput reduces and that time is a good time for the base callers and other things to catch up. So that at the end of the sequencing run, we have something. So that's, what ONT is doing as well with the uh, base calling at the moment. Even then, still they can't keep up the super accuracy. But anyway, for all these, writing to a file would be essential as per today. But maybe in like 20 years or 10 years, I don't know, like, yeah, it might uh, change when all this processing can like uh, really be done in real time. And uh, the base caller improvements saturates that like in the future, there'll be no much like need for rebase calling them again. But as for today and the near future, seems like there will be a necessity to store the data for now. Yeah. These are like future questions. So I can't really predict what will happen, but I'm just like guessing. Yeah, thanks a lot. Definitely makes sense. So we have also a question on YouTube. Uh, maybe I can uh, forward that to you. Um, so unfortunately, there is no name. Uh, so a username with T uh, is asking, uh, what platforms are the most performance critical applications of Slope 5 uh, to run on? And do you have any insights on the hardware utilization being achieved there, especially in regards to vectorization and memory? Uh, can you please repeat the question? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. I guess the question is more about uh, what are these critical applications that we can use uh, 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 slow five with? Uh, yeah. And so how, so what are your insights basically related to the hardware utilizations for such uh -huh. applications, uh, especially like vectorization and I guess yeah. uh, processing memory stuff, if, if this is what the user meant with memory, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, uh, like uh, application wise, we have shown that like base calling improves when we use slow file and memory quite improves when using slow five compared to uh, what's already there. And a uh, few other like uh, applications we have shown are things like methylation calling. Uh, that's another application where slow five uh, gives quite a good benefit over others. And also any custom like, you know, modification detection tools, the community is developing on top of nano data. 
those have been like substantially like uh, fastened by using a uh, slow file. So likewise, any raw signal analysis, direct raw signal analysis method can be benefited in terms of performance and memory when using a uh, slow file. And about vectorization, uh, so some of the uh, portions in slow file, like using the, when doing the decompression, uh, it's uh, already like accelerated using vectorization, some parts. Uh, but uh, like not all of them, because we are doing optimizations to uh, slow five based on the need basis. At the moment, we don't see any like, uh, you know, performance uh, overhead when reading and decoding the file compared to other analysis. So because of that, we haven't like put too much effort into like improving the decoding and stuff. But in theory, if one, one wishes uh, like in future, you can even directly support the decoding using SIMD or like any other FPG or whatever accelerator because it's a simple like uh, format. So it's very obvious to like, you know, get the data and do what you want rather than going here and there to the whole file to find something you want. So again, yeah, so at the moment, decoding reading is not a bottleneck. So we have put limited effort to accelerate those components. Yeah, so it's really, yeah, interesting the global, you know, the uh, optimize, like, you know, the performance uh, for a workflow rather than the, like, you know, tiny little fraction. Yeah, so some numbers, like how much time is spent on like reading versus like processing with slow five, one can refer to papers like uh, like the buttery yield where we show the breakdown of the time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, like I can also add uh, one more item to that list. Uh, so you mentioned this, uh, which is, I think is a very good idea, uh, fetching data from uh, cloud, I guess, uh, perhaps yeah. even randomly, like whatever you need uh, rather than uh, downloading everything at once. That makes a lot of sense, I guess. Uh, but maybe also on top of it, uh, I guess it will probably be also critical to send the data to some, uh, to send the data to, to yeah. the, say, to supercomputers. Uh, or like for cloud computing purposes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we may very well uh, as well like imagine uh, we're doing some on-site uh, sequencing and perhaps even we want to do again real-time analysis. Yeah. We may perhaps even choose to send the data to uh, yeah, yeah. for cloud computing purposes and then do the analysis there and then get the response yeah, even yeah. in real time. So reducing that latency is perhaps can it can be achieved also significantly by reducing the data uh, yeah, that exactly. you, that you need yeah. to send. So I guess there are, there can be some benefits there also. Yeah, using that's another process. benefit. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we are like doing something similar at Garvin because the base calling cannot keep up on the Promethean. We like for some when we are at high capacity, we are doing uh, like something like that where we batch by batch send the like data. Uh, currently, it is of course done using a very simple like script uh, to our like institutes uh, cluster, and mm -hmm. then doing. Of course, the same idea can be expanded to use the cloud or whatever uh, like methods. Yeah, that's right. So there is this follow up question as well from the same user uh, on YouTube. So I guess the question is. So do they run on supercomputers, small clusters, laptops, or smartphones? Uh, I guess by day, uh, the user means the applications that are using Solo 5, uh, I assume. All right, yeah. I see. Yeah, so I mean, if we, if they like, if you go into the, like the original Solo 5 paper, uh, we show that Solo 5 outperforms Fast 5 uh, on supercomputers, cloud computers, and then, representative like embedded systems like Jetsons, laptop, desktop, SSD, HDD. So we have shown like eight, 10 different architectures, both random access and sequential access, how it can improve the performance. So I would say 
like currently like seems like for all the like architectures out there it like much better than like past five we believe it is the like equal or co like comparable or better to pod five but because pod five is keeping changing on every few days we can't really do a representative test we are waiting until it becomes a bit stable and like uh, like you know finished if it ever happens so that we can do some proper testing yeah Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and importantly, like because slow five doesn't use memory mapping, it's quite beneficial when you are having minimal memory. It doesn't need to like hog the whole system run available to load the file to memory. We have seen like problems with pod five when base calling that the memory goes really crazy, and other like you know applications getting seriously affected because of that because in clusters not just you who are running the application right mm -hmm. so others also running so if you the file reading takes the whole virtual memory available and the ram available on the system then it affect the other and then it try to conflict with the you know virtual memory things go to the swap and then all the like you know troubles and things happen but the unfortunate thing is these kind of system level things are very hard to like, you know, quantitatively measure and tell because it's happening in a high performance computer where there are like hundreds of users. So we can't really do a controlled experiment. But yeah, we will do some pet experiments at least in the future when it comes to a state that it can be stably tested. Yeah. So also, I guess clearly I'm convinced at least based on your uh, answers, uh, pod five perhaps is not also a long-term solution, I assume. Uh, so do you see uh, ONT getting adopting the slow five? Yeah, I mean, there are, the it's a possibility, I mean, in the future at least, because currently, I mean, ONT said that they want something a bit like generic and things so that they can keep checking and like, you know, because it's a evolving, like company uh, and they wanted to like have a format which is like underlying format which is supported by a well-known you know like uh, like foundation like apache rather than a community develop which makes sense but uh, like that for to, as per today perhaps when the technology matures and when they realize that they have come to a place they are like you need even more improvements than what pod five can give, then might be come up, up with like adapting low five or like similar binary format ideas. So that's something in the future we can, I think, just observe and see. Yeah. Thanks, Kristin. Uh, are there more questions, by the way? Otherwise, I can just. Uh... Uh, keep asking. Well, maybe you have some, uh, I guess. Uh, you are muted. Uh, I am muted. Thanks, John. Um, I do. So um, maybe we've, we've been talking a lot about file formats. Um, you mentioned also your uh, expertise in uh, raw signal simulators, a uh, squigulator, yeah. I believe it's called. Yeah, it's really, um, yeah. So perhaps looking at the same problem then from the different angles of base calling, um, in your expertise, what would you say, how well do we understand raw nanopore signals at this point? So. Um, I mean, currently, clearly, there's some component that we understand well with Kamer models, right? That we can map one to one to bases, and then there seems to be some unknown component. We call it noise a lot of the time. Um, and the question here that I have in my head often is: Is that thing truly stochastic, and the base caller just can't do better than it does already, or is? This stuff mostly deterministic and we just haven't really figured out how to deal with it properly. 
Okay, so I think it's a combination of both at the end because definitely, I mean, we can see there's a lot of like like noise coming from like you know the electrical like components and stuff. But at the same time, it's well known that the like time domain warping is caused by the fact that the motor protein can't like you know like exactly keep the speed going on. Like the, you can't like really like control the speed at which it like go through the pore. So that also varies. So that causes the time domain noise. So those kind of things are a bit known. And we know that some variations are due to uh, like unknown modifications. Like previously, we didn't know that it can do methylated C versus unmethylated C long time ago. So it would have been just thought of as noise. So, so it's a very like, you know, like uh, open question at the moment whether all the components are actually noise or real. The neural network could be like somehow capturing some of those like information by itself. The reason we don't know is because we don't know how to figure the neural network out, right? It's a black box. So there could be many other like unknown things. So as coming to that, of course, like regulator only simulates what we know as per today. And looking at the base calling results, we see that there's like some close similarity in the like accuracy and stuff. And the false positive base calls are also similar. So I think we are modeling to a certain like extent, but not 100% because all those unknown things are not modeled. That explains why we don't get identical results from the base caller for real versus figulate. But it has been a very good tool for us to uh, see like how these neural networks behave with different types of noise. Yeah, we increased the time domain noise and we found out that it's quite immune to a lot of variability. Yeah. Whereas in the, like, uh, what is it, the amplitude domain, like a slight increase in the, like a bit more increase in the noise can drastically affect the base code. So things like that, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So, so there's both partially known properties of the sequencer and then perhaps new properties of the data itself that's deterministic but also noise i guess yeah like two stochastic right. noise interesting yeah and we can't like and it's known that there are these other molecules going around also can apparently affect the current right in a solution it's stochastic so <laughs> those things are there yeah it's ionic current and you know like others coming by can affect and all the sort of things could happen and there are complexities like pores get blocked for a while and then passes so many like you know natural phenomena that's like you know very hard to predict stochastic yeah. so that discussion actually makes me think about the future of uh nanopores perhaps so i guess let's in an ideal world let's assume that uh hopefully we're solving uh most of these noise issues at least uh, uh such in a way that like we can get some uh meaningful analysis from the raw signal data but i guess the other property is this throughput of these uh uh nanopores um and i guess recently so i've been uh, we've been reading this discussing this dtwx uh, or dt uh, wax paper is uh, gpu acceleration of dtw and i guess in that paper they are already prefetching this uh, uh the throughput of future nanopores so they are i guess assuming 10x or 100x improvement in the throughput uh -huh. uh, yeah. so i'm curious how realistic are those uh let's say uh numbers or like how realistic is it to happen in the near future let's say for for a nanopore to have such a leap uh in the, in the throughput uh, I mean, we have seen quite a like big throughput increase from going from like R9 to R10, like flow cell chemistry. 
So it, I think, happened in like five years or something, that leap. So likewise, there's a chance that after like five, six years, another new chemistry is coming and that could give a leap. Uh, but as I th what I think is as in most technologies, the first leaps are like, you know, very big, but then it's kind of saturated. So might like saturate after like many years. Yeah. But those like throughput numbers are very hard to really predict. You know? So I wouldn't like take too much into it because it's all predictions, right? So. Yeah, that's true. Uh, maybe like there is even a certain limitation because I mean, as you may also know, that those proteins are really the important structure of these uh, nanopores yeah. to control the speed. And we put them just because to control the speed, I guess, so that they move, I guess, relatively slowly. So we don't also want them to be extremely fast because of this, I guess, uh, the sampling uh, uh, rate that we're making, right? So maybe there's yeah, exactly. a limit over there. Uh, yeah. We cannot exceed, yeah. yeah that's right, yeah. So these are very like open IT questions, which, uh, deep, which depends on how the chemistry in the nanopores advanced. Yeah. yeah, but definitely there will be an improvement in what we have today looking at the past, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the thing is like by the time the algorithms would have substantially changed as well. So I find it a bit like, I mean, not that like meaningful to like you know think uh, that much ahead in the future with the current algorithm we have mm -hmm. because at that time if we thought about HMMs that was the way that was used for base coding but today it's completely different so what we have today might target the today's throughput and data but in five years time when the new throughput is come method may also be different so a bit you know like uh, uh, like it's a guess, so. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I guess I'll wait a few more seconds again to, to ask at least my questions on this thing. Some other people want to ask more questions. Okay, I have, I guess, then at least two or three more, Hasinu, if you have time. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so I guess I'll uh, move the focus to Haru. I mean, it's quite an interesting work. Uh, uh, let's say, I guess this is, uh, I'm not sure if it is correct to say, probably this is the first uh, FPGA-based uh, uh, DTW acceleration for uh, nanopore raw signal analysis. Is that correct? Uh, I think it like it depends on how like you know you like phrase it because there have been some like other works accelerating just pure DTW right mm -hmm. so but like of course targeted for nanopore uh, like uh, alignment this is the like first time there was a close work called Spiegel filter where mm -hmm. the minor major like you know their target has been a six rather than yep. FP. So I think for nanopore specific alignment, yeah, this was like, to our knowledge, this was the first time, yeah. Yeah, uh, I agree with that, I guess. So, uh, and I guess, as you may agree, uh, one of the main limitations is the, the length of the, I guess, the target sequence that, yeah. that thing can map to. And this is mainly because, I guess, uh, uh, you'll need to do uh, subsequence dynamic time warping because the signal is needs to be aligned to the entire genome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess you are already mentioning this in the paper that there are these uh, new works such as uh, SIGMAP or ROHASH can, that can do, I guess, uh, seeding before. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. So I believe you imagine or envision some sort of integration of HARO with, with these works. So could you elaborate yeah. this, uh, like, a little bit more on this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, I mean, how I envision it would be 
we could potentially use the seeding plus chaining based methods to uh, get some like approximately like you know correct potential places like five hits. Uh, then we could use those regions from the reference and then the corresponding reads and align using DTW and then get a more like, you know, uh, like accurate answer out of all the five chains, like which one best matches. So something like what we see in the base domain alignment, I would say, like you first do the chaining and then finally apply smith waterman to find the actual best alignment. So my thinking is probably if we combine these two uh, methods, uh, we could like solve the problem of like the large, you know, the genome size, which is not going to be possible with DTW alone, whatever hardware acceleration we use, we can't use a human genome on DTW, that's for sure. So throw those hashing based methods to get the potential places. And then if we like do that, then we can get a very like, you know, more like accurate answer, I believe, rather than just relying on the, the, the chaining score alone. So something it's I envision, but we haven't tested the hypothesis yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that makes sense. I guess at least based on your answer, I assume you are still expecting that the DTW can still be a bottom like in, in these uh, applications. Yeah. Because that right. could also be a chance the bottleneck shifts somewhere else, I guess, in, in those applications. So uh, yeah, I was curious if you had such an observation, whether the, there is, the bottleneck is still there on the DTW side or is uh, shifting a little bit. To, to other steps. I really like, I mean, I think I, the latest paper we did and the publication, we had some like, uh, like measurements uh, of like how these things uh, are compared to uh, the hashing based method. So I think at the moment, uh, I think I didn't, in, at that time the row hash was not possibly like there we tried uncalled and figma. And uh, like that also was taking a bit of time at that time, but again, they were not optimized and stuff. But looking at minimap and all that dynamic programming one is the bottleneck rather than the like, chaining. So I think like it's again a prediction. So we have to wait until like all the things become a bit more mature and then we should do a comparison. So yeah. yeah. No, I, I definitely agree with that. I think there can be some opportunity here. Yeah, um, this current, because we haven't, we, we, because this raw base signal like method just started, right? Like mm -hmm. it wasn't like something explored for a long time. Exactly. So, so we can't like expect a method like uncalled or raw has to solve all the problems like performance and everything accuracy at once. So we need to patiently wait until those slowly improve. And yeah, when that comes, we might be at a time where the DTW would be like a bottleneck. Then yeah. that would be helpful, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a bit futuristic statement, which I like really can't like, like predict, but yeah, mm -hmm. something to discuss. That's true. So also, I guess uh, maybe one more uh, follow-up question related to this. So DTW or chaining, uh, et cetera, are uh, really useful, um, especially to, to pin the correct mapping position, yeah. right? Yeah. So rather than being able to map the read to our correct genome, they allow us to map to the correct position even, not, not the genome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I guess if we uh, uh, shift the focus a little bit, uh, a little bit more and think about this depletion or enrichment type of analysis where we just need to find, let's say, whether the read is coming from a particular genome or not. So I guess the question is not which position is it, but which genome is it, right? So yeah, yeah. maybe chaining or DTW is, an, let's say, um, is an extra or uh, is an so I'm not sure what is the right word to it, but maybe it's, it's an unnecessary, let's say, computation to, to answer that uh, particular answer. 
Uh, yeah, if you are doing metagenomic like selection, probably that's the case. But for yeah. example, at, like uh, when we use the selective sequencing uh, for gene panels, like on the human genome, rather than sequencing the whole genome, we just sequence a panel of known genes which are like known to cause certain diseases. So in mm. such a cases, like these positions are important. So I see. Those kind of things, yeah, this would become useful. But of course, for places where you just do the, like, you know, genome only, if you are just interested in the like, metagenomic sample, that could probably not be like applicable. But you can't really like tell without actually doing a like a proper experiment because there are many similar like approximately similar areas in different genomes. You say that like even human and a monkey is not too different, right? So that way, till whether just hash hits alone would do it, I'm not 100% sure. You might need chaining yet. So, so things like open-ended questions we need to like explore and see what's happening. These are still like un, like you know, explored areas, signal level stuff, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess that that was actually also part of my question you already answered. Uh, thanks, Asimba. Um, are there other questions uh, from audience? And I guess I'll have two more. Quick questions uh -huh. yes, <laughs> sure. before letting you go. Uh, um, uh, so you can see that we are quite excited about the analysis of one of our signals, especially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, first of all, a fun fact. Thanks for clarifying why you named your tool Slow5. Uh, now it makes sense <laughs> because I guess you wanted to, I guess, make a, a statement to Nanapur. Calling it yeah, I mean, it was right. simply, I mean, it was initially started as a joke, not a real thing. You know? <laughs> like, like they call fast five for something that is horribly slow. So what should we call for something that is really fast? <laughs> Let's ironically make it slow five. That's what we thought. At the point. And then it like, you know, got a bit of traction and then everyone came to know with that, uh, with that word. And so we kept going. And it also make it less boring. So, uh. okay, but yeah. In, for in serious people, we have an alternate acronym like super fast, uh, lightweight, ONT, Wiggles. That's slow. Five. <laughs> S5. Okay. That's what that makes out of sense. <laughs> yeah. so that's a very good acronym as well. For, for... That's a reverse acronym. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so my other question, so that, that wasn't actually a real question, but uh, yeah. So the other question is, you mentioned this rebase calling thing, I guess, uh, that you store your data and are rebase call. I guess that's uh, probably very good insight. Uh, also for, I guess, energy purposes, right? People are wasting energy as well as course, yeah. wasting compute cycles to while, while doing rebase calling. Are there, uh, probably there are some, numbers related to it but do we know on average like how many times the people are rebase calling uh, their data uh, because i guess that's uh, that's very important to show also in the future papers to, to make a claim about this uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to know if there's such a source that we can use let's say mm -hmm. yeah so that's uh, like i mean getting an exact number would be a bit hard because that depends on like the like particular data set too. I mean, yeah. they are at Garvin Institute, at least there have been some samples where we have base called more than 10 times because those samples are like that important. And those regions in the genomes are the hardest bits to solve. So we base calling makes sense. But for some cases, you just like do uh, once. So it's again a very subjective thing depending on the problem. Yeah. So, what are those applications, Hasindu? Uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned those, maybe I missed uh, that you're doing rebase calling. Okay, so now let's say, like, if you take R9 data set 
that was done some time ago base code the accuracy is like 93% but mm -hmm. today if you do the same base coding same data set base code it's like you know 96% uh, something mm -hmm. like that so this is a substantial improvement in certain hard regions mm -hmm. like these strs and stuff complex like regions in the genome so any project that involves like looking at those hard regions uh, it would be important to uh, base call them and whenever we get like do other studies population wide studies or like some analysis with like data available out there sometimes people upload their fast files into sra and something but before we reuse that data because the data has been base called so many years we just base call them again today to bring all our other data set to the same level you know otherwise hard to compare those so you know like yeah but very hard to like tell this average this many base calls are done that's something i can't give out of my uh, mind probably we have to start logging it at, at least our institute so that we can get a number <laughs> yeah. but that will be a good source to cite i would say that's very important i guess uh, yeah but, but one, uh, yeah like source could be uh, you could look at these like uh, reference data sets like mm -hmm. na2l h7a yeah, so dm data or uh, hprc that has, what is it human pan genomic project and the rna expression project so like those you can have a look at how many times they have included the updated base codes yeah, yeah. So i think in na2l878 at least it's like four to five times they have repeated yeah but again like it probably because it's a reference data set. if it's just a human sample and just forget about the analysis after the thing they may not never do it but someone may download the data set and rebase code that yeah. you can't count right yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think that's another perspective, right? Many people are downloading the same raw signal data and yeah, exactly. on their end. Yeah, that's another yeah. way. Of, yeah, they do that a lot. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I guess yeah, these are uh, yeah, great insights. Uh, Thanks, Asindra, again. And some papers, like when they published those methylation calls thing, was not even available. But mm -hmm. today, people download those data and then do methylation calls. Exactly. So, Maybe something will appear in the future, and people appears, will appear. Um, like new, like because there are many types of unknown modification, and there are no models to do them. Mm -hmm. Now slowly we are seeing models for M6A in Guppy and Dorado, which is like modified versions of A. Mm -hmm. So might yeah. come, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I agree with that. And apparently, ON is improving the like centromio and telomio region based calling accuracy because they are performing pretty badly at the moment so when that comes it might be of interest to do those again so and you may have seen for plants there is a separate model in guppy yeah. because previously we used like the normal model and didn't perform well because those uh, contexts and tamers which are prevalent in standard like human and other genomes different in so likewise, a lot of things to come. So. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, thanks, Asindo. I guess if there are no other questions, uh, do we have more questions? Let's, let me ask one more time. Or we close. OK, I guess if there are no other questions, uh, uh, thanks a lot, Asim. It was a great talk uh, and uh, also great answers. So it was very insightful, I would say. And uh, definitely looking forward to hopefully seeing Slow 5 or its relatives getting adopted by ONT or other nanopore uh, uh, based, let's say, companies so that this process can accelerate. Also, it can accelerate, I guess, in my opinion, the hardware software co design works because. I believe uh, they are they are also getting uh, let's say bottlenecked by this uh, file format because whatever you may design right now, depending assuming a certain file format, it may 
very well not be the case in the in two years or three years and like lots of firms that put on the hardware design maybe it's just uh wasted just because of that changes in the file format uh so yeah i guess uh again thanks again hasinda and uh yeah thanks everyone for attending thanks for the like invitation to do the talk it was a great pleasure and uh, yeah if you have any other questions or anything feel free to drop an email yeah sounds great thanks a lot uh see you then everyone <laughs>